It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lasseur from the CBS television news staff and August Hexer, chief editorial writer for the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is J. Ernest Wilkins, Assistant Secretary of Labor. Our guest tonight has had an unusual career. He was a prominent practicing attorney in Chicago before he became the first member of his race to be appointed to sub-cabinet rank. And already he's distinguished himself in his first meeting with the Russians on an international labor meeting. Mr. Wilkins, do you think that the fact that you are a Negro is helpful to you in these international labor conferences? Yes, Mr. Lesser, I think it has helped me a great deal. You must remember that the three-fourths of the people of the world are non-white. And I think it made a profound impression upon the people from the rest of the world when they recognized that the United States of America had sent as the head of its delegation a Negro. But Mr. Wilkins, uh, I don't think you've ever been associated with a labor union. Now, do you consider that a drawback in discussing these labor problems uh, in the international field? No, I do not consider it a drawback at all. As a matter of fact, I think it has been an asset because my mind has been open on all questions affecting labor. Well, uh, Mr. Wilkins, what are the uh, frames of reference on the, uh, the body that you represent in the United States in the International Labor Organization that recently met? Well, what does it do, if we can get that straight for the, for the uh, television the, audience? Uh, the International Labor Organization, commonly referred to as the ILO, is perhaps the only international labor body that I, in a uh, conference that I know, that's tripartite in its structure. Uh, there we have representatives of the government, uh, representatives of management, and representatives of labor, meeting in a common forum and each speaks very freely and independently upon all matters that come before that body. Well, Mr. Wilkins, uh, the Russians have recently rejoined the International Labor Organization, and how does uh, labor there treat its employers? Uh, do you differentiate in the international body between labor and employer in Russia? Well, or between the government, or between the government and the employer, I think that would be even more difficult. That was one of the principal objections raised to the employer and employee delegates from Soviet Russia and her satellites, that they have no such thing as uh, free employers or free employees. And uh, the peculiar thing about it that I observed at the conference was that uh, at no time during the conference did the uh, employer delegate or the employee delegate uh, from Russia or her satellites vote in a different manner and the representative of the Russian government but, and its satellites. But didn't the American delegation tend to stick together also in its views? No. Uh, the, uh, frequently, the government delegate from the United States voted one way, and the employer delegate voted another way. Frequently, the uh, employee delegated voted contra to the way the uh, delegate from the government voted. Uh, but the delegates from Soviet Russia always voted solidly as a bloc. Well, Mr. Wilkins, what is the International Labor Organization trying to do, and uh, how can the United States apply itself to its aims? Well, <coughs> the primary objective of the ILO is to improve uh, working conditions and living conditions of laboring people. We recognize that the standards in the United States of America are considerably higher than they are in the other nations of the world, I mean, particularly the underdeveloped countries of the world, but it is to our advantage to have working conditions improved in those countries because as working conditions are improved in the underdeveloped countries of the world, our working conditions are better. That is to say that the competition between the workers of the underdeveloped countries and our in the United States of America are not so keen. They're, they're we're on auto parallel. Did, well, did, did Russia, during uh, this last meeting of the International Labor Organization, show any tendency to compromise or to, uh, or to go along with the other countries, or was it pretty much in opposition? Uh, Russia, the delegates from the Soviet countries, uh, never compromised on anything. Uh, they were adamant in their positions. Of course, they pictured uh, labor in Soviet Russia as being a very fine thing, but they never compromised. They took their position and stood by it, even in defeat. 
Well, did we ever compromise on any of our positions, Mr. Wilkins? Uh, I don't think we ever compromised, uh, except in certain instances uh, when the matter came up of uh, uh, giving uh, uh, the delegates from Soviet Russia and her satellites deputy positions on committees. We voted for that uh, because a deputy on the committees of the ILO only sat in on the meetings and never had any vote at all. Mr. Uh, Wilkins, do you think that these uh, overseas labor unions are important factors in the great political struggles of the Cold War? I think the uh, labor unions overseas are very important. I think labor is one of the facets by which we either spread or stop communism. Where you have a satisfied uh, labor force, I think uh, uh, you do not have a fertile soil for communism to develop in. How would you evaluate the role of our American labor unions in international affairs and in regard to the ILO's work? I think our trade unions, uh, particularly the AFL and the CIO, uh, play a very important role in developing uh, better relations between the working people of the world. Certainly, uh, uh, the labor unions of the foreign countries are uh, more kindly disposed to listen to what is said by American labor unions. I think they're sometimes suspicious of what the delegates from the government say to them. Well, Mr. Wilkins, do uh, you think we're doing enough to help and encourage these labor movements overseas in the free countries? I don't think we're doing everything that we ought to do. It seems to me, uh, in the field of technical assistance, we are doing some things. But I think we ought to do considerably more. As you know, Mr. Lesseur, that uh, three-fourths of the peoples of the world are non-white. And they sometimes look with suspicion upon the attitude of the American government. We tried to point out at the conference in Geneva that the United States government doesn't expect any particular favors from a nation that it helps. It only helps these nations trying to make them strong enough to be free. Well, Mr. Is, there any, excuse me, uh, is there anything we can actually do uh, that our government can properly do to increase and encourage labor organizations in other countries? I think we can do a number of things. The principal I think, thing I think that we can do is to send uh, labor technicians particularly to the foreign countries uh, where they might uh, learn how we operate uh, between management and labor. Wouldn't we make great uh, enemies among uh, certain elements of management in those countries? I do not think that we make uh, enemies. Uh, certainly, there might be some uh, feeling of uh, uh, mistrust, but generally, I think we'd work in a good field. I don't know whether you know it or not, but uh, we have uh, uh, foreigners who come to the Labor Department in Washington to study our methods, uh, management relations between labor and management. We have them study uh, our field of uh, workman compensation law and other laws. Uh, so that they can go back to their countries and try to put into effect uh, some of the principles which we have established in this country. Well, Mr. Wilkins, I was thinking about uh, one of the problems here. What about segregation and government work here? Aren't you a member of a committee that is trying to do something about that? Yes, I am a member of the President's Committee on Government Contracts, which was established by President Eisenhower in August of 1953. Uh, the primary function of that committee is to see that there are no discriminations in the matter of employment where government contracts are involved. As you know, there are perhaps $30 billion worth of contracts led by governmental agencies every year. And the purpose of this committee is to see that there's no discrimination in the matter of employment, upgrading, apprentice training, and so on in connection with these government contracts. Have you been effective as a committee? You have no uh, powers, I suppose. Is it a matter more of study and research? I think the committee has been very effective. Uh, we do not have um, uh, any penal powers or powers to enforce penal sanctions. But I think through the governmental agencies and most of the principal agencies are represented on this committee, the, government, the President's Committee on Government Contracts has done a very effective work. It's been done very quietly but very effectively. Mr. Wilkins, it seems to me that uh, Ralph Bunch, who is now the Undersecretary of the United Nations, declined to take the very job in which you now find yourself because he felt that he didn't want to work in Washington because perhaps his children would be subject to segregation down there. Now, you have taken that job, but 
Do you find that uh, these conditions are onerous to you? Uh, Dr. Bunch was offered a job as Assistant Secretary of State. And he did not want to come because he said there was discrimination so far as the schools were concerned. But as a matter of fact, Mr. Lesseur, during the past 20 months, a great many changes have taken place in the city of Washington. There's no discrimination so far as hotel accommodations are concerned, <coughs> no discrimination in restaurants and other public facilities. I do not think, and now that the Supreme Court has passed on the uh, matter of uh, segregation in public schools, uh, integration will start in the Washington public schools on next Monday the 13th. Washington is a much different place than it was 20 months ago. In other words, I take it that you feel your race has something to be thankful for during these uh, Labor Day anniversaries? Uh, yeah, we think the entire American public has something to be thankful for because uh, this decision of the Supreme Court uh, made all Americans free. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Wilkins. It's been a great pleasure to have you here tonight. The opinions expressed on the Laurentine Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Laurentine Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and August Hexer. Our distinguished guest was J. Ernest Wilkins, Assistant Secretary of Labor. <coughs> A Longine watch commands the respect of those who discriminate in their choice of a fine timepiece. This is a tribute to the prestige of Longine and not to its price, for actually a Longine watch costs little more than a watch of much inferior quality. For excellence and elegance among the finest of the world's watches, only Longine watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals. In fields of precise timing, Longines watches have won the highest honors. In observatory competitions, Longines has established many world's records, won countless prizes and awards. So when next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as an important gift, these are facts to remember. And remember too, whatever the style or type, there is a Longines watch made just for you. Longines automatic watches that wind themselves waterproof and shock-resistant watches, chronographs for sportsmen and scientists, and literally hundreds of beautifully styled Longines dress watches for every taste. And yet, you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. And remember, too, that if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a Longines. So why not insist on getting a Longines? the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. At Longines Whitnor Jewelers, see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Le Coultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of Le Coultre, division of Longines Whitnor. <laughs>